Si vezi kiniso, si vusele la utembega. Uh, next up, it's Teresa Ndanga, who obviously joined us prior um, the days before to discuss as well. But today's topic is sustaining media training institutions. Uh, Teresa Ndanga from Misa Malawi, over to you. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation there. And I was, as I was saying, I will be presenting on sustaining media in, uh, training institutions. And uh, just to say that um, I like how um, uh, the presentations, the discussions, the panel discussions are kind of all speaking to each other. Um, so we have had discussions, for instance, on monetizing um, journalism education. I think it was on the second day. And again, it also speaks to um, the discussion we had earlier on that uh, Zoe moderated um, and uh, the launch of the handbook. Um, so my presentation as well will also speak on some of, to some of the things that have uh, already been mentioned by my colleagues and um, fellow presenters, presenters who have come before me. Um, so just um, a run through, um, uh, by the end of this presentation, you will have had um, a, a picture of uh, the current dis challenges um, uh, that we have uh, for, for media training institutions. Um, uh, I am hoping that uh, the Malawi situation also speaks uh, to the current situation in other countries as well. Or if not, uh, definitely there are things that we will co continuously learn from each other. And then I'll also talk about our journey as Misa Malawi in terms of establishing our own training center and where we are now and where we see ourselves going. Um, thereafter, I will then kind of delve into sustainability strategies. These are just some of the things that uh, I want to highlight, but definitely there could be other areas as well that um, you may also wish to bring in uh, if we have time for any discussions after the presentation. Um, so again, thank you so much for, for having me. So the, the types that I'm going to focus on in this presentation, the types of media training institutions um, that we'll focus on um, will be the ones that I have termed as pure academic institutions. And these are those that have been established purely to offer training um, uh, in, in journalism and probably other courses as well. Um, uh, here in Malawi, we have a number of them, both private and, um, and uh, those that are uh, uh, run by the public institutions. Uh, or the government. Um, so we have a number of them that are already you know, um, operating as such and offering courses around uh, the media. Um, but we also will be talking about enterprising nonprofits. So these were not established to offer media training per se. Um, but they have kind of also um, delved into this particular area. So they're nonprofits, but now also, you know, having an arm that is kind of making profits for the nonprofit. And they're also offering um, the, the, the media training that uh, we're talking about um, right now. So the challenges that um, currently were established as academic institutions. Um, number one is that, as I said, we have a number of in this particular service that are providing training uh, for journalists or the media um, in general and other courses. So definitely because they were established as training institutions at a profit, the priority for the majority of them is indeed to make a profit. And um, uh, that is a problem, I've termed it to be a challenge in the sense that that being a priority, they don't necessarily look at what are other things that we could also be prioritizing. So in as much as you know, they, they're looking to offer this training, but they would want to have as many students as possible coming on board, simply because many students will translate into you know, money, will translate into a profit. So that priority on its own, it's not, it's not a bad thing. We are all looking to make a profit. We are all looking to make money, but where now this becomes a priority and it overrides the importance of other aspects, then it becomes a problem. And that is why I'm terming it here as a challenge. Number two, 
is that um, most of them, the majority of such training institutions have a limited resource base um, in the sense that they're just usually looking at making money out of the fees that the students will be paying. So they are not looking elsewhere to make additional resources. They're just looking at, at the, the fees that the students will be paying. And that becomes a constraint in, on its own uh, because it's just one. Um, uh, therefore, it also goes back to feeding to the first challenge, which is prioritizing profit. Because it's just one, they need as many students as possible uh, to come and pay um, for, for the fees. And therefore, the this institution itself will survive on that particular basis. Another challenge that I have also listed here is that there is limited flexibility in terms of changing the curriculum. So we also how, um, for instance, on the second day, we had a discussion on monetizing uh, journalism education. And there was a mission around um, you know, looking at what are the changes out there and kind of also uh, reflecting those changes. But in most educational institutions, in most media training institutions, um, you will have a curriculum that is kind of fixed for a period of time. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily speak uh, to the changing world, the ever-changing world. Nowadays, we are having things, you know, being introduced, new approaches, new formats, um, uh, we have just seen the, 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 in the previous discussion that we had, you know, um, so a lot of things that are coming on board, but are we speaking to those changes or are we stuck with a curriculum that was developed a couple of years ago, um, which we are still using now. So this also becomes a challenge. And if they need to change the curriculum, it's a long process. Uh, because these are well-established institutions, academic institutions, and therefore they have to go through a very you know, long process to be able to just effect some changes in the curriculum. And therefore that becomes a problem because they will, the time that they'll be speaking to changes that happened a year or two ago, things have already again improved to something else. For the enterprising nonprofits, um, most of them, um, uh, will be establishing the training institutions, the, train, the, the media training institutions um, with donor funding. And, and therefore with donor funding, you kind of have you know, some money out there, some money that is coming in and you will be offering most times free training. And because of that start uh, where you had some money, you were offering free, a free service, um, a free training, it kind of, you, you are well known for offering that service free of charge. And therefore at the time that you're now trying to introduce maybe some fees, it becomes a bit of a problem because people are already used to uh, attending some training um, that they didn't pay for. So donor reliance may be a problem in the long run, um, uh, but as we'll see later on, there's also um, some suggestions that I'm making in terms of um, how this can become not a challenge, but, but rather uh, can become an opportunity um, in its own right, but also um, maybe when you, are, you tie it to other um, suggestions that I'm also um, suggesting at the end. Again, for these kind of institutions, you see that there's dominance of short courses. So most times you are only doing short courses, one week, two weeks, if it is long. Um, and maybe in some instances, maybe you have a break, it goes on to like three weeks or a month. But most times these are short courses. So you're not really like at the end looking at giving someone a diploma um, that they can show, go and you know, get a job with as the academic institutions are doing. So the short, but the short courses are really, really important in the sense that, you know, for those that are already in the newsroom, those that are already practicing, it kind of refreshes them, but it doesn't speak to others that you may also, you know, find to be clients in the long run. So the dominance of short courses may also be a challenge. So it needs a bit of some creativity uh, on how you can continuously monetize this to ensure that it, your training institution is sustainable over time. Another thing is that, you know, the target members, um, because most times for these enterprising nonprofits, they will have a target audience that they already speak to. So for instance, if you look at Misa Malawi, it has a membership of journalists in Malawi. 
Yeah. And when you're offering these trainings, most times you are targeting such a group of people. And unfortunately, um, most times, you know, the target members that you are targeting, you know, they, they don't necessarily apply so much interest to pay. So you are operating in, a, in an environment where you are obviously spending, you need money to offer a training such as that one. But at the same time, the target audience that you're looking at do not prioritize paying for such a service. Or indeed, most times, you know how, um, uh, for instance, in Malawi, we have media organizations that are constantly complaining about the declining profits in the industry. So they wouldn't necessarily have, uh, maybe they would like to support you in the sense of paying for the journalists that attend uh, this, this uh, courses, but at the same time, do they have the resources to be able to spend, you know, and is this a priority for them? So most times you find that the target membership may be restricted um, in the way that uh, they, they are spending their resources and may not prioritize uh, this as, as something that they would want to pay for over time. Now, these are general challenges, and they would apply for the nonprofit. They would also apply for um, the, the academic institutions, fully fledged academic institutions. As I mentioned earlier on, we have a number of training institutions that are offering uh, media training in Malawi. And I'm sure that this is also the case in other countries as, as well. And this kind of leads to competition for students. And where now you're just you know, competing for, uh, to have a lot more students enroll with a particular institution. Um, all other factors, as I mentioned earlier on, are kind of drowned. You are not projecting those as important factors. You are not looking at those as things that you should prioritize in offering um, your training but rather you are just competing for students who gets a lot of students, who enrolls more and more students and that translates in the long run to the money that you're all looking for. Another general challenge is weak, a weak monitoring. Uh, yes, in Lao, we do have institutions, training institutions are offering a professional um, standard that is required. Uh, uh, by, by the set standards. Um, but unfortunately as well, we do not have that go down to other institutions such as those that are... Okay, so I was talking about the general uh, challenges that uh, we are facing as a sector that is offering the media training. Um, and um, number one, of course, I spoke about um, the, the number of institutions that are there and that we are competing um, you know, for students. Enrollment is becoming very, very critical for the survival of the training institutions. And uh, the weak monitoring system, you know, we have uh, training institutions that are not monitored at all. Here in Malawi, we have a body that will monitor at least from degree level going up. Um, but those, of, those institutions that are offering, for instance, a certificate or a diploma, or those that are the enterprising nonprofits, do not necessarily have an, a body that is monitoring or enforcing mechanisms to ensure that the training institutions are complying with the set standards. Uh, so that becomes a problem. Are short courses not supposed to speak to set standards? Um, if you're offering a one week, two weeks uh, short courses, um, are you not supposed to stick or you know, make sure that the standards you know, are being enforced? You're speaking to the set standards that uh, the monitoring body has. That does not happen and it becomes a bit of a problem. It's just up to you to make sure that you're offering quality um, training uh, for the media, but not necessarily that someone else is monitoring and checking what you're offering. And another big, big, this is quite big as well, is that most training institutions are more focused on theory. But when the students go uh, to the industry, they have to practice. And they kind of begin from scratch where they have to lean on, on the job. They have to kind of get back to applying the theory when they are already on the job. That becomes a, a bit of a problem. And we, we really need to look into how to bring in practice uh, the time that the students are still in the classroom. 
So that is currently lacking, but I know that um, uh, several institutions are going towards that particular direction to try to blame the theory and practice. Now here, I'll just try to speak about the MISA Malawi Training Center, which um, we launched in, 20, um, uh, in 2019. And uh, we, as I, I, as I mentioned earlier on, MISA Malawi is kind of in the group of enterprising nonprofits. So previously, MISA Malawi was just purely an advocacy body fighting for media freedom or freedom of expression and opinion, access to information and all that, but now has diversified uh, to having an, an actual media, um, a, a media training center. You know, where we are offering training short courses um, to those that are already practicing and kind of trying to diversify to look at how we can also uh, target those that would want a journalism training. So our journey started really in, in 2017 in trying to establish the Misa Malawi Training Center when we started kind of planning and looking at how we can diversify, make sure that we are also enterprising on the, while we're doing the advocacy work, there's also a part, a section that is also looking at enterprising. And um, one way that we felt uh, we already are quite established in that particular area was offering uh, training, because this is something that we kind of were offering our, our members already, but we had not established ourselves as a training center. So that was the direction that we wanted to take. So in 20, from mid-2017, it was more about really planning our journey towards the direction that I've mentioned. We did um, quite some extensive research um, to try to see um, uh, what are the things that we need to prioritize in establishing that particular center. Um, uh, so we have done this continuously. It's not something that we have done and stopped. We did, yes, at the beginning, but we continue to do. And that is why on the second line, you will see that even up to 2019, we're still continuously planning because we had to also respond to the changes that we continuously um, saw along the journey. So um, the research is, was really a continuous process. Then we went Teresa, to- Teresa, just in terms of interest of time, uh, I know we're running a little bit late in terms of programming. Yeah. We, still all want, we also want the audience to engage you. Uh, and the session is supposed to end around 11.45, maybe at 12 latest. Mm. Uh, just so in terms of that, uh, maybe uh, just so you're aware of you know, how to adjust yep. uh, so that we can actually, actually allow for some interaction because I think it's a very important uh, term in terms of sustainability uh, at institutional level. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, so I'll just quickly run through, as, as, as you said. Um, then we did um, a kind of a, a fundraising uh, program. So there were a number of activities that we, um, we had to um, carry out uh, to fundraise for that particular project because we had a target, an amount of money that we try, were trying to, to raise. So we raised a bit of, half the resources were raised locally, but of course, DW Academy came in to also support us along the way. And uh, we purchased the land. Um, uh, there was already a structure that was there, but we had to change it to fit our plan uh, because we wanted the structure to um, have an office as well as the training center. So we kind of changed the plans a little bit so that the construction and then the launch happened in 2019. And we started hosting our training workshops. We have done a number of them targeting our own members, but also extended it to the outside. So we have trained police personnel who are into, um, who are spokespersons. We have targeted um, public communicators, those that are working for public sector and even those that are working for the private sector. But as long as you are, say, a public um, communications officer, manager, and even those that even grant interviews to um, the media. Right now, we are extending because we have plans to actually have it as to now target those that would want the, to join the journalism profession. Um, so we are extending and are constructing the second phase of the training center as we speak. So we continue to fundraise. As you can see, the fundraising line goes up to 2021. Now, sustainability strategies, I will run through to try to catch up on time. 
Um, number number one, I think, is the quality of media training. And this, I think, my colleague on uh, the, in the last uh, session on the second day kind of um, explained uh, quite a lot about the quality of um, the training that we are offering. You know, uh, I, there are several alternatives. So why should people choose you? Why is your training unique? Um, uh, and why should people choose and pay for that particular service, for that particular training? Would they be proud to have, you know, graduated from your training institution? That is something that we really seriously need to think about and also looking at the challenges that I, I spoke about earlier on. Industrial linkage. This is very, very important. Every day, the media sector is kind of changing. New formats are coming in. Uh, things that you weren't able to do in the past, you are able now to do. Now is our training, you know, in response to any identified gap? Are we speaking to what the industry requires? This is something that because if we're targeting the members or people that are already in the industry, they have to see value for going back in class and sitting and listening to someone um, educate them on something or having a discussion on, on new developments. So this is something that, again, we really need to ensure, make sure that we are linking our training to um, the industry demands so that they're speaking to each other and someone is really able to pay um, or willing to pay for that particular training. And um, again, tying to that, media institutions should continuously seek to improve capacity or develop new services and indeed innovate new technologies every day. So it's not just you know, having students sit in the classrooms. Are we innovative enough to even tap into training others that may not be able to come to sit in a classroom at our training center or at our institution? Are we innovative? So we have to continuously innovate and develop. It is also very important to limit expenses. Money is scarce every day. We also say, you know, uh, money is a scarce resource. So let's look into ways we can limit expenses, you know, limit permanent staff. I've already seen how numerous institutions here in Malawi tap into part-time, you know, lecturers and so forth, uh, staff outsourcing. For Misa Malawi, we have our trainers who outsource. They are able to offer this training to other countries, to other institutions, uh, um, outside the country, you know, um, the premise ownership, which is something that we did as Misa Malawi, so we don't have overhead uh, cost and income generation on those same premises. We're able to hire out some rooms. We're able to rent out some. Um, uh, we're making money out of the same and ownership of equipment. You know, develop your own. We uh, for Misa Malawi as an eating all all those and their needs, speaking to their needs as well. And as well, you're, you're not just looking at what is the gap, what is the demand out there, is it market driven, but you also need to create demand. So you create a product that you are able to sell to both the funders and the participants. So it's not just about, you know, what is there, what is lacking, but even create something that, you know, you will be speaking to something that may be a gap somewhere there, but people have not seen it yet. In creating that, you're able to attract funding and you're also able to attract you know, participants uh, to be able to pay for that particular service, to be able to pay for that particular training. You know? Also go beyond the training, offer communication expertise. This is something that as Mr. Malau, we're also trying to do as much as possible. Um, uh, train and media personnel, that's something that I also already mentioned um, in trying to not just limit ourselves to the membership or people that would just want to join journalism, but even beyond CEOs, train them as well because they interact with the media quite a lot. Collaborations. This is again one area that we have done quite a lot as MISA. We, we kind of look at you know, collaborating with international expertise. So we have a local pool of trainers, but they are, they are usually paired with ex international trainers so that uh, there is exchange of ideas, knowledge and skill. And that also helps that the students or the trainees get international experiences because we don't want to train someone who is just fit for the local context, just fit for a career in Malawi, but we would want to train someone who can fit in an international um, environment and be able to perform even better um, while they have been trained in Malawi. So we think that you know collaborations are very, very important and someone sees value in that and be able to pay for that as well.
I mentioned the challenge of practical training, very important. Let's get students ready uh, for the industry, both theoretically and practically. And uh, that will also add value to the training that we're offering and someone will be able to pay. In brief, what I am advocating for um, is that we need quality media training. If we're talking about sustaining our training institutions, we definitely need to make sure that there is value for what some, someone is paying for. So the quality should be our priority. Money will follow the quality. Flexibility in terms of the changes that are happening in the industry are also very, very critical. We should always seem to be moving uh, with the times. We, we don't, we're not stuck in, in, in 2000 while well, the world is in 2020. So let's move with the times. Uh, and these changes are not just at the global level. They are also, once it happens globally, internationally, it's also happening locally. So let's also fit in in the global world. Um, again, let's not limit ourselves, even if you're an academic institution, purely established as an academic institution, look into other programs, multiple programs as well, consultancies, um, uh, offer communication training to other you know, non-journalist um, members and so forth, uh, advocacy programs. So, you know, blend all these so that once, you know, this one falls off, you are able to still stand on one program or another activity. Um, and obviously the hybrid approach to resource uh, streams. Um, uh, if you ju we just look at the fees that students are paying uh, for the service, then we may not be able to survive in a competitive environment. But yes, the fees is an add on, but let's also look at having the donors come in, having the, the fees come in, but also having to um, offer a service in a different area altogether and have all that money come together. And that, that is what, how I think that we'll see survival or sustain media training institutions, both in Malawi and of course beyond. Thank you, Patrick and Nina. for that informative presentation in talking about the ecosystem that is required to sustain uh, journalism training institutions. My first question, really, just to get the conversation going, obviously, uh, we'll take about another 10 minutes just to uh, <clears throat> finish the conversation. So if you have a question, please post it in the chat box or please raise your hand uh, to ask it to Teresa. Teresa, my first question is, it seems like the biggest threat to journalism education uh, is the growing tendency uh, that could be threatening for journalists or for young journalists to be functioning in this environment as a result of um, a decline in, 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 in true application of democratic principles. Uh, so what do colleges not just need to make sure from a supply side perspective, but, but how do they make sure that, that, that the field remains lucrative in terms of being attractive uh, to young people as something that they want to continue and pursue as a career, what's the responsibility from training institutions with regards to encouraging young people to join uh, the field of journalism? Um, it's true. I, I think one one solution really is uh, to make sure that you know they see that they are not limited by their borders. So my my um, practice as a journalist should not just be looking at the local market. Because if I just look at the local market, obviously I will kind of begin to think, um, uh, you know, jobs are scarce and there's no need to train as a journalist. I think that's a conversation that we have also had locally. But the training institutions need to make sure that, you know, because we need these students to continue to train as journalists. We still need more, more journalists. Others are leaving this, the industry. And we need more and more creative journalists. You know? So, but we need to make sure that the training institutions are kind of speaking to the value that is being offered internationally. We are no longer competing at the local level. Even where you are a training institution in Malawi, we should always look at how is how 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 is my standing against a training institution in Namibia, against a training institution in Zimbabwe, against a training institution in, in the UK, would I be able to withstand the pressure? And will the journalist that graduates from here be able to perform very well in an environment where they're working, for instance, um, at Deutsche Welle, uh, at Deutsche Welle or BBC? 
those international um, um, media institutions. So I think, I think we need to demonstrate value to would-be journalists, that they're not just getting trained for the local market. We're definitely training them for a bigger career, and that career is beyond the borders. It's just up to them to grab this opportunity. But if we limit ourselves and not really um, be flexible to the changes that are happening elsewhere uh, to accommodate them in our curricula, to accommodate them in our short courses and so forth, it will be very difficult for someone to see value because they have already, you know, they're already seeing the challenges that the sector is facing. But let's broaden the market. Let's make sure that this training is being offered for you to look beyond the borders. You can work here in Malawi. You can still work in your local context. But if you wish so wish with this particular training, you will be able to get a job elsewhere. Okay. I think that's a very relevant answer in terms of just not limiting yourself to the physical boundaries of our storytelling, uh, but also being inclined in, in, in I think, more incre increasingly uh, what's become, you know, very much clear in terms of environmental reporting that there are no borders when you're looking at for even in financial terms of the Pandora Papers. So I think it's very relevant to say that uh, what, I, what I wrote down was demonstrate value beyond borders uh, mm -hmm. from your answer. Teresa, thank you very much. Any other question we'll be taking you, please raise your hand uh, and we'll be giving you the opportunity to ask Teresa a question. Uh, if you don't have to, we are running slightly uh, out of time, yes, but we still do. Yes, sir. I, no. Who do we have there? Please introduce yourself shortly and then ask the question. Okay, thank you so much. I'm Edward, um, General Manager of Umun FM. I just want to ask or to hear from Teresa on the issue of the proliferation of uh, uh, media training here in Malawi, uh, later I've also noticed that uh, the other institutions like the technical colleges, they are also offering journalism uh, education. But I feel like if media, I mean, uh, Mr. Malawi or Media Council of Malawi can raise an advocate to make sure that maybe uh, the government can also empower the higher institutions, the, the, the body which regulate other, um, other, other universities to make sure that uh, um, these smaller colleges, which are also offering journalism, they should also be regulated. Their curricula has also to be reviewed and make sure that uh, whatever is being delivered is really relevant in as far as uh, boosting the journalism is concerned. Mm -hmm. No, I think Edward, you're raising a very important, um, a very important um, um, view. I think this is something that we may want to think about, uh, both for Misa Malawi and the Media Council. Uh, the Media Council, of course, champions the professional side as well. Um, and we are also concerned in terms of responsible uh, journalism. So this is something that we definitely need to take up. I, I do not think, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I don't think that uh, the smaller, so to say, in courts, the smaller institutions should be left scot free because they're still offering, you know, the, the giving out diplomas and, and the people that are graduating from here expect to get a job and they have been trained. They, they hope that they have been trained according to the expected standards, industry standards. And uh, therefore, there's also need to make sure that, you know, the standards in these other smaller institutions are speaking to what we expect of a journalist, practicing journalists, both in Malawi and abroad. Um, so thanks for that suggestion. I think we, we will need to think about it and present it to uh, the government as, as well. Thank you so much. I think you're muted, Patrick. I was thinking, Edward, uh, his mic was unmuted. So hopefully you wanted to ask a question. Well, in that case, Teresa, any concluding remarks from your side? Maybe if Nina wants to come in here, pose a question. Uh, I think we still have a few minutes left, but uh, in, in, in the absence of that, uh, Teresa, any concluding remarks? Um, I, I just wanted to encourage, um, since you know this is a really a platform where we have uh, different participants across the, the world, and I think we have shared uh, some great experiences. Uh, there's a lot of expertise from this group. I think we need to be looking at how we can collaborate, the different institutions trying to collaborate to see how that kind of brings a lot of value out of uh, the, the training um, that we are offering to journalists. 
um, and that the international expertise should be brought together um, so that the students that we're training really um, are not limited to just the local skill and knowledge that we, we may be offering. Um, I'm glad that we have already started doing that, but there's need to continue that um, in, in the foreseeable future to make sure that, you know, in the long run, um, the, the people are able to see that collaboration is not just benefit, it, it, it does benefit both the institutions and the students that are getting that particular training. So I would, I would really strongly encourage collaborations. Um, um, it's beneficial for, for, for everyone really in, in that process, the institutions and as well as the students. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you, Teresa, with those concluding remarks. Collaborate locally and globally uh, is the message there from Teresa. Obviously, from Misa Malawi, talking to, you, talking to us about how do we sustain training institutions uh, for journalists in the future. Siveza ikiniso, sivuselela ukutembega.